and welcome everybody to another show of uh, the 12 o'clock show with Mayor Joe. Joining me today is my good friend and board member, uh, Jenny Quesenberry. Welcome, Jenny. Oh, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Oh, uh, it's going to be a great show today. Uh, I'm really happy that you're here. Uh, I know we've got a lot of good questions for you that we'll get into, but we do have a few things to kind of start off with. Uh, first off, I want to give a shout out to our street department for doing a fabulous job with the snow and the ice over the last couple of weeks. Uh, they get out there, they get it done. Uh, it's been great. A couple of things that they always suggest when it comes to that, try and keep your cars off the street if you know snow's coming and things like that. Uh, that's a big thing. And uh, the other one is, um, you know, if you have your sidewalks, always good to go ahead and shovel those out of the way so that way uh, neighbors, if you people are out walking in the cold weather, uh, they can kind of walk on the sidewalks. So those are your responsibilities. So, But again, a real good shout out to the uh, Snow Warriors for that. Uh, also wanted to mention that this is February, so it is Black History Month. So I do have a proclamation. Uh, in an effort to help council move along a little faster, I'm going to go ahead and do my proclamation here on the show today, declaring that February is Black History Month, so I'm going to go ahead and read this now. Whereas, during Black History Month, we celebrate the many achievements and contributions made by African Americans to our economic, cultural, spiritual, and political development, and whereas, in 1926, historian Carter G. Woodson established a week in February to celebrate black history, which in 1975 was expanded to a month and changed to Black History Month by Ch uh, President Gerald Ford. And whereas Woodson selected the week in February that included the birthday of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, two key figures in the history of African Americans. And whereas on February 3rd, 1870, the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting the federal government in each state from denying a citizen the right to vote based on that citizen's race, color, or previous condition of servitude giving African-American men the right to vote uh, across the nation, and whereas the observance of Black History Month calls our attention to the continued need to battle racism and build a society that lives up to its democratic ideals, and whereas the city of Reynoldsburg is proud to honor the history and contribution of African-Americans in our community throughout our state and nation. Now, therefore, I, Joe Begany, the mayor of the city of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, proclaim February 20, uh, 2021 as Black History Month, in the city of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, to join in its observance. Uh, so a couple of quick notes on that. As you know, I used to be a teacher, and uh, we would always uh, discuss the idea of Black History Month. And uh, I didn't necessarily run my classroom like that. I actually tried to include uh, Black History in every single unit because Black History is American history. It's, it's not just relegated to a specific month, but it is good to highlight different achievements. So please keep an eye out on a number of different social media sites about the achievements of African Americans in the United States history. So uh, congratulations for that proclamation. Do have one other announcement before we get to the good stuff. Uh, we do have a code enforcement town hall meeting. Uh, it will be via Zoom, um, and it's going to be on March 11th at 7 p.m. Uh, this is basically going to talk a little bit about what co uh, code enforcement is going to look like for 2021. I had a meeting with our great code enforcers yesterday to talk about things that we're going to be looking to do uh, in the commercial areas, apartments, residential, things like that. Uh, so it's good to get that out there for the people to see exactly what they're going to be looking for and really understand what the process is. Um, it's not just people driving around and saying, oh, I see that house doesn't have this or that. A lot of it is complaint driven. Um, sometimes it becomes like a almost like a domino effect. Uh, you go to one location and say, this is something wrong with your place. And then the owner of the property says, well, what about this house? And then you go to that house and then the next house and the next house. And then and it just kind of moves from there of neighbors kind of uh, letting everybody know what they're doing with their property. But uh, some things that we, we are definitely focused on. Uh, but we'll get to that in detail uh, again on March 11th at 7 p.m. So now we turn it over to the reason why we're all here. Jenny Quesenberry, uh, this is your fourth year on the Board of Education. Yes. And uh, the last year has been really boring, right? Nothing big going Nothing on? Nothing at yeah. all. Very, very, very dull. Um, so we'll go with a couple of questions that I have for you and then um, take some audience questions that have been submitted okay, prior to. perfect. Uh, first thing, you know, obviously COVID's going on. So what have you done? What has brought you joy that you kind of enjoyed uh, during this time? Um, I think the biggie is be, being able to maintain the health of my family um, and also some real quality time at home with my husband and our dogs we don't see much of the family except on zooms and things but it's been it's been nice just um, being able to relax okay uh, I'm right there with you are we still everything yeah, good? Everything's okay good. just making sure um, now as far as uh, Reynolds work teachers and students they've obviously um, been faced with a lot of different challenges um, what are some of the highlights things that how do you think they've handled it how do you think things are going things like that you know being an educator as well it's I think our teachers are doing the very best that they can do with the situation as it is 
And what everybody needs to understand is I've not heard a single teacher, staff member, principal say, I wish we could do virtual all the time. Everybody wants children <laughs> in school. Yeah. We, I think we're all in agreement that they need to be in school. Um, but we also have to keep our, our students and families and staff safe. Now, Reynoldsburg recently was, uh, I guess you could say, privileged to get the uh, facility over at the uh, field house uh, for vaccinations yes. for teachers. So that's been pretty good. Are board members eligible for those? Did they yes, get Yes, they are. All right. Yes, okay. mine is tomorrow. All right. Mine is tomorrow. So, yes, um, I know there were some scheduling issues, but that is to be expected. Yeah, yeah, it's to be expected. So, yeah, for us, um, it was really interesting. Uh, my wife was on trying to register for, oh, seven and a half, eight hours, something like that. Yes. You know, just a really quick, easy thing on a yes. Sunday. But uh, no, uh, I, I know we're looking forward to it. I know we're trying to work with a couple of different partners. So when um, there's it comes to general public, those under the age of 65, mm -hmm. uh, that we'll have the opportunity to get yes. those done. But uh, apparently that's one of the perks of being on the board. I, I'm, I'll, I'll miss that one. Yes. <laughs> Uh, now, looking forward, obviously, all school districts have their own challenges. Are there any, like, what are three challenges that you think the city of Reynoldsburg schools are going to be? What, what do you think those challenges are? Well, I made be? notes for okay. some of the questions that I knew were coming. Um, I think one of the big ones, helping our community to understand that this, the decisions that are made um, are not as easy as somebody reading something on Facebook. Um, there are issues, there's guidelines, there's laws, and we have to adhere to those when making the decisions that are made. Yeah. Um, another one is our infrastructure. Um, we definitely need to look at some more space. Um, we've got incoming citizens. Our community is growing. Um, and then let me see, our third one, um, racism. Racism is kind of showing itself in some emails that we've gotten. Um, so we need to help our students to understand what is racism um, and how it's played a part in our country. Um, but also helping our students and community in dealing with some of the racism that is showing up. It's unfortunate. I, I uh, watched the last board meeting and uh, heard uh, board member Angela Abram, mm -hmm. uh, who will be on the show in a couple of weeks, uh, talking about that. And she had mentioned it to me before in some of the emails. And uh, really since uh, Superintendent Brown was in office, uh, he and I had talked a number of times about things that had come across. And obviously, unfortunately, uh, racism, racism is present. It's still here, even though we would like to think it is not. It is right. just shown it itself is. in different ways. It's not, it's not, you know, white only water fountains and things of that nature. It, it's a different thing that's there, but yes. it still unfortunately is Absolutely. present. Absolutely. Well, I applaud you for taking that on and being a good example for our students in oh, that regard. Because I think, again, that's where that's where we have to start. So now we got a couple of questions. Okay. Um, these are some uh, that were submitted on a uh, one of the Facebook posts, so I kind of pulled them all off. <laughs> okay. Um, first one is, uh, what type of uh, special type of events in the district is planning for seniors this year? Is there anything that you know of right now for seniors uh, to kind of to kind of reclaim a little bit of their senior year? Right. At this point, there is nothing planned um, that I am aware of, but we are certainly wanting to make things as memorable as we can for our seniors. And as soon as decisions are made it'll be put out there for. Okay. Um, as far as the graduation ceremony, um, are there any different options the district is looking at? I know that there was a letter sent right. out that uh, because of what's going on at the Schottenstein Center with the vaccination site, right. and who knows how that's going to be, that that's probably not in the, the it's not something you can count on for a location. Right. Well, so, we've, we've reserved it, okay. um, but it is very tentative. And again, we have our, our guidelines for mass gatherings. Um, if we can have that space for traditional graduation, we certainly will. Um, however, we still have our senior celebrations that'll be at each academy, either virtually or um, in person. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted to kind of highlight, um, let, I've been through several, as you have, graduations. Um, at the Schottenstein Center, for those who have not gone, um, you're dealing with parking. So parking is an issue. You've got to walk quite a few ways. Um, there's a lot of cheering when children, students' names are called. So you will probably miss your child's name being called. <laughs> um, an area that I'm concerned about is the waiting area for students mm -hmm. are shoulder to shoulder. There is no social distancing at all in that area. Um, at the stadium now at Reynoldsburg uh, Livingston, um, it, was, it was a lot of fun last year. First of all, that was it, it was fun. You didn't sit through hours and hours of waiting and hearing um, speeches. 
families were able to come right up to the goalpost, um, and it may be 20, 30 feet away from your, from your child, to see them get their diploma. Um, they take pictures there. They have boards that you have another photographer taking pictures of. Students decorated their hats. They wore fancy shoes. Um, they got flowers. They got a yard sign. So we're doing as much as we can to make that celebration memorable for, for students and for families. And I, and I really think this is more for the parents. Parents want this and we want to give it, but we have to do it as safely as we can. Well, one thing that somebody mentioned at one point um, is that because they can have weddings, why can't we do this? And, um, and this is just my opinion. Uh, it is not based on any conversations right. with anyone. Um, that's based on economics. Um, I believe a lot of decisions the governor has made is based on economic purposes. And weddings are revenue generators where a graduation ceremony is not. And that's why I think the biggest difference is between the two. Now, at the same time, at weddings, you can have a wedding, but you have to remain seated. And you can't dance, dance. apparently, at a wedding, which is my favorite thing to think about. <laughs> um, little divine pictures looking at you saying you can't dance. Uh, so, but for those people that have never been in the Schottenstein Center in where the kids are, it, it is as jam-packed an environment as well. And if you can imagine, even look back at some of the pictures of graduation right. ceremonies in the past, um, the, just even the, the area on the floor of the Schottenstein it's, Center, right. it, it is certainly a very close-knit type of thing. Um, this is not for my son in any way, shape, or form. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, no, he would prefer the answer to be no, there's nothing, but um, a lot of people have asked, is there going to be a prom this year or, you know, what, what would it look like if a prom were to happen? Right. And you've kind of hit part of that is that um, we are still mandated, mm -hmm. um, not only about the social distancing, but dancing certainly won't be social distancing. Um, we do have be singing Footloose yeah. or something. Um, we do have a space reserved if those guidelines are lifted. However, we're also looking into the possibility of it being an outside prom. I know people aren't going to be real road with that but that makes it a little bit safer and still gives students that opportunity for a prom and again once we have things finalized we'll pass it on yeah because i know it's not an easy thing right um one other question that i got is uh as far as um the process for kin early kindergarten admission i know they have to go through a screening process can you tell me what that specifically is like what that process is well for kindergarten um the curriculum is really intense. Um, me being old and in kindergarten, it was more social. You learned how to play with others. It is not that way anymore. Um, and students who are in a half day program have to absorb all of these state standards in half of the amount of time where students who are in full day kindergarten um, get. So many of our younger children and educators, you might hear that referred to as summer babies, um, typically haven't developed those social skills that are necessary for kindergarten. And again, since play is not a priority in the curriculum, students have to really learn how to be a student um, and be socially ready to tackle all those challenges that comes with being a student. Um, and academically, there is a huge difference between being smart and being school ready. So for people who have advanced four-year-olds, you know, we, we get that. Um, the IQ test that is required is just one little metric piece to a lot of other things that we put together. Um, I personally would advise that if a parent is having that dilemma, consider your student either going to school at their mandated time and being at the top half of their class or going early and taking the chances of being at the bottom half of that class. Yeah. So it is, it is something that a parent has to decide. Um, the IQ piece though is really an IQ in comparison to their age, appropriate, their age peers, not kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a four year old, that IQ is based on, um, looking at other four-year-olds, if that makes sense. Yeah. Not as five and six-year-olds. Okay. Well, there's, I mean, there's a huge there. Any, any parent knows that there's a difference. And, yes. Um, you know, I remember, you know, having kids that would come in much later in my life uh, when it came into high school, but, you know, you had a different age variance between some of those, and you could tell certain kids were brought behind. Um, I know there was one that was kept behind uh, for athletic purposes. They wanted that extra year yes. of eligibility. They red shirt. Yeah, yes. um, which was an interesting kind of philosophy. I'd never run across yes. that before. But uh, 
No, there's a lot of things with that. Um, it's it's a good question. I mean, I know that the district is in favor of all-day kindergarten. I know that there are always talks about the potential for going to all-day kindergarten, uh, but space is going to be at a premium at that. Yes. So uh, I know the district has got an ally here with me uh, with the idea of all-day kindergarten and whatever it takes to get to that point. So when you guys are ready to make that push. Right. And that was actually one of the things that I ran on my campaign, mm -hmm. campaign was um, all-day kindergarten. So we do have two uh, sites now that are all day kindergarten mm -hmm. and I would like to see here in the near future not this school year yeah. um, to look at hopefully increasing that to everybody having that opportunity for all day kindergarten absolutely I'm, I'm right there with you all right now comes the hard part those questions from the public we don't have any right now oh, all, right. Right. all right so I'm gonna move on real quick <laughs> um, I've answered everything you've answered it all so <laughs> Uh, but one thing that I, that I will say, all the board members, um, you know, they have a social media presence, they have emails, they have phone numbers, they will call, and um, Jenny's being very bashful. Uh, she's been an administrator in Columbus for a long time. She's retired and kind of still goes back into it. She knows the game. And she has an absolute passion for special education. Yes. Um, if you really want to get her going, it, you mentioned special <laughs> education, and she's ready, <laughs> ready to fight for it. Um, always a good thing to have somebody as an advocate for their kid. I, I yes. always tell people that. I even tell people now that I'm not in that, that field. I say you need to be an advocate for your child, especially if you have concerns when it comes to special education. Absolutely. So I applaud you for dealing with that uh, because, again, th those are kids that just need a little bit extra uh, all the way across. And honestly, their parents need that, that guidance as well. Absolutely. Well, I'd love for you to stick around for a little bit sure. if you have time. All right, I will. So uh, we do have a couple of other fun things going on. Um, again, our military banner program is in full swing. So if you are interested in having a military banner uh, honoring someone in your family that's either current uh, active duty or retired or somebody maybe a great grandfather that may have served in a previous conflict, uh, please go to our website and take a look at the information, what you need. Um, there's very The only real requirement is a very specific picture uh, grading. You have to have a certain uh, uh, picture uh, when it comes to the picture to make sure that it's clear enough. Uh, so we can put it on our banners uh, for Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Veterans Day. Uh, so we have that going on. Um, it looks like parents are ready to kick their kids out of the house. Uh, our enrollment for spring soccer, baseball, and softball uh, has gone really well. Reynoldsburg has held true to fashion that as the deadline gets closer and closer, the enrollments go higher and higher. So deadlines have been extended a little bit. Uh, so we are working very similar. Um, if you were able to participate in the fall soccer program, you got to see how I've spaced out everything was, what the requirements are for safety and things like that. So kind of keep that in mind that we are taking those things into consideration uh, and making adjustments as the governor sees fit uh, when he lets us you know, work and play well with others. Uh, we did have our tomato festival meeting last night and it was actually a really good meeting. Uh, we actually had a couple of people on talking about some new things. Um, I guess there used to be a, a parade uh, that was there to kick off the tomato festival or in the tomato festival. So we had some conversations about that. Uh, we had some good conversations about a sensory day, uh, so that way for students that uh, or for children that don't want to have the bright lights and loud noise, specifically Kona ice cream was mentioned. Um, I think everybody agrees with that one, but we'll just go with sensory day uh, just to have an idea of that. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of we're in the process of plugging in what events are where. Uh, we talked about the Tomato Wars. Uh, the Tomato Wars will be making a comeback, and I did see, and I know Sarah Reed's a good a uh, longtime follower of the show. Um, Sarah, I'm going to reach out to you. What I thought, uh, she had mentioned that, you know, uh, the, the potential for the waste of food, that if we're throwing the tomatoes away, wouldn't it be nice? So you know what I thought would be a really good idea? And Sarah, I hope you can help us arrange this. Let's do a food drive. Instead of, you know, just signing up, say you can sign up to be in the tomato, uh, the tomato wars, but have a food drive for one of the local food banks. Um, so that way we're kind of giving back a little bit. Now, those tomatoes are not always the freshest of tomatoes, so I don't think they're edible, um, at least on purpose. I think accidentally when people got hit with them, probably. Uh, but that's something that we can kind of look at as well. So Sarah, I, I'll reach out to you in the next day or so uh, to talk about that. But if you want to get involved in the tomato festival and you want to be a part of either the volunteer part, if you want to just be somebody who brainstorms idea ideas, we have a meeting uh, the first Tuesday of every month, and you can come in and join there. Uh, you can also join some of the community commissions uh, that are around and have influence with the Tomato Festival as well. So we hope to encourage people to do that. Uh, my water department hint uh, for today is a very, it's, an, it's a different one. It's actually water that um, you certainly don't want. A lot of times what happens after rain, uh, people have water pooling in their backyards. Um, and part of that is due to the way that the backyards are designed for drainage purposes. So when you're looking out into your backyard, there was a set of houses that uh, some neighbors had concerns about. 
And what ended up happening is uh, when people put um, the little sheds in the back or they do certain gardens or landscaping in the back, what it does is it alters where the water flow goes. So sometimes it may not necessarily be that the creek is overflowing, but maybe a house upstream had something that altered the way the water is going or how it flows. Um, so that's part of it. So when you're doing those types of things, please make sure you're coming into City Hall, uh, talk with a permit tech, so that way they can tell you exactly what the best place for that location is. Have it inspected after the fact so somebody can come in to make sure that if that water's flowing, the, whatever it is you're putting in the back doesn't necessarily alter the flow to either flood someone's yard, which then can get in their basement and all of those things. So it's just a little bit of a water info. I know usually we're thinking water inside the house, but this time, uh, given the fact that snow melting and the spring coming up, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about some of those things. Any questions so far? Nope, not at this time. All right, so uh, my development update. I know everybody's waiting, but I'm going to make you wait a few minutes longer. Um, first thing, we've got a couple of big places that are coming up. Uh, Chick-fil-A, Calibre, uh, which is obviously located at the Logan Steakhouse in that 256 in front of the uh, Target shopping area. They are in the final stages of getting all of their paperwork approved, and uh, they're going to be looking to uh, demo their building in the not too distant future and then build the uh, Chick-fil-A. So I would say we're probably within the next month or two. That is more weather related at this point uh, when you know it's easier to dig into the ground when it's not frozen solid. Uh, Caliber Automotive, you've already seen some work out there. That is again in that 256 area as you're coming off Taylor Road Southwest. Um, we also have some news. Uh, the Cashmax building uh, that is a little bit further up the street from here on Main Street uh, is actually going to be redesigned and uh, it's going to have a couple of nice um, retail establishments in there. It might be a restaurant, it might be a shopping, something like that. So it's going to be put to a different use there. Uh, our Rose Hill and Taylor Road townhomes are going to be getting uh, ready for construction again. Uh, it's the same thing. It's more of a weather related. Right now they're going through all the engineering phases and things like that. So we're working on those. Uh, we do have some news. Um, we are going to have a new submission on our February 18th uh, building and zoning board. Uh, it will be for uh, owner-occupied townhomes off of Wagner Road uh, in between uh, the uh, VFW and uh, Messiah Church in that general vicinity. A couple of year, a year and a half ago, or actually about a year ago, council was asked to talk about putting apartments in there, and that led to a whole host of things. Obviously, council rejected that and allowed for single-family homes in that area, but not apartments. Um, so developer Ryan Holmes is going to come in and do that. Uh, so they'll be in there, uh, but that will also help uh, kind of speed up the process for the Wagner Road development, which is making sure that we have uh, park, uh, you know, uh, bike paths and sidewalks up and down Wagner Road. So that'll be something here. So I'm going to show you a picture of it, of what these townhomes will look like. Again, a lot of brick front and things of that nature. Uh, they're going to be very similar to what you've seen on Rose Hill, uh, except I think these are going to be the next price point higher. Uh, so if you have questions about that, you can go in. It's called the Wexford, so you can take a look at all the fun little diagrams. Um, I think I did get a question from uh, Michael on uh, some of the development. What's going on behind Dairy Queen and uh, Gingy Go? Uh, as of right now, nothing. Um, if you know, the Cattle Club was there. Uh, it has been torn down because the building was condemned and it was unsafe. Uh, but nothing's been submitted to us. Um, we've talked to the owner of the property, and there's no plans anytime soon. He's uh, more concerned with some of those other areas, like the cash max that I was just talking about. That's kind of the focus area that he's looking at right now. Now, we also have something for Old Town. Uh, somebody asked last week, a uh, conversation, you know, you mentioned social media and getting news out there. Uh, somebody had mentioned about uh, East, uh, East Broad Street in Old Town. What's it going to look like? So we've been finalizing plans and working with the property owners up and down Main Street between the Davidson and Jackson to get it ready. So I'm going to show you what it looks like kind of now. These are a little bit fuzzy of pictures, but I can kind of get you an idea. So this is what it looks like right now. Now what we are going to do is we are going to you know, make things look a little bit prettier. So we're going to be adding in uh, some more trees and shrubs to kind of break that out. We're going to be expanding the sidewalk a little bit to make it more pedestrian friendly. Uh, I believe we're going to have a new cigar shop at this location. Uh, so you have that there. But there's a lot of other things going on in that area. And this is just right in front of uh, the Memorial Plaza parking lot uh, at the corner of Lancaster and Main. So it's going to look a lot like this all the way down Main Street. Uh, to give you an idea. Now that construction is going to start probably in July. Um, but once, once it is, trust me, if you're watching the show, you'll know, um, yes, Main Street traffic is going to be horrible this year. Um, it absolutely is because we're going to be repaving everything. 
from boundary to boundary. Uh, it's going to be starting out basically around the Burlington Coat Factory, and it's going to keep all the way down on Main Street, all the way past Summit Road. So it's going to be a huge thing. So there's going to be a lot of people that are going to complain about traffic on Main Street and construction. We will do the best job as we can to notify what's going on. Believe me, a year from now, it'll be worth it. It'll be done. It'll be cleaned up. And it'll be taken care of. Um, the Ohio Department of Transportation is responsible for almost all of it. The only area that uh, is not from the Ohio Department of Transportation is the area that we were just talking about between Davidson and um, Jackson for this year. And then we did get awarded the OPWC grant, the Ohio Public Works grants, uh, for next year in 2022 to finish off uh, the section of Main Street from Jackson to Wagner Road, which will play very well because we're hoping in 2023 we'll then move right into that Wagner Road area. Any questions? We did have a question come okay. back in, and this was relating to, Jenny, what you were talking a little bit earlier about the um, enrollment program. It says, uh, Kitty wants to know, the early enrollment paperwork says the IQ must be 115 or above, which is considered gifted. Why do early enrollment kids have to be gifted? Would they just need to be on the same level as other five-year-olds? The, the IQ, from the way that I've understood it, that IQ score is that gifted with four-year-olds. So it's their same age peers. So we're not, it wouldn't be what the students are in kindergarten. So those five and six-year-olds already in kindergarten. It's that uh, piece that it's with their same age peers. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now the moment you, no, just kidding. I'm gonna go to one other thing. <laughs> um, beginning on February 8th, uh, every uh, city council meeting that is going to be virtual is now going to be featuring closed captions. Uh, so for those of us that are that know someone or if you are hearing impaired, you will actually have closed captions uh, for our virtual council meetings. So I just wanted to uh, send that out to you. Uh, major props to Molly Crasher, our clerk of council extraordinaire, uh, who uh, efforted this one, so that's good. All right, so now what everybody's been thinking about. Why do I have, a big thing of fireworks right here. Um, it's about patience. Um, it's about waiting for that moment to arrive. So a number of months ago, uh, director, uh, development director Andrew Bauscher and I met with an organization that uh, is looking to uh, move into Reynoldsburg. And um, it was a long painstaking process in terms of convincing them that Reynoldsburg was the right location, uh, that we had what they wanted. And after a long search and a lot of things, uh, they decided that uh, this organization is going to purchase the Kmart property, and now it becomes official. The Kmart property has been sold. The Kmart property will be torn down in its entirety, just the Kmart property, by the end of the summer. Now you're asking, well, what's going to go there? It's not what you think. So what I would like you to do is I want you to join me, same bat time, same bat channel, next week. And you're going to find out exactly who it is that has purchased the Kmart property that is going to be tearing down the case. We're really excited about this. That's why we have fireworks. Who's going to be tearing that thing down and what it means for the city of Reynoldsburg. Uh, we could not be more proud of the efforts of Director Bauscher and really everybody at City Hall that put in to convince uh, the organization that this was the right place for them. Uh, we were in heavy competition with a number of locations. Uh, it's going to be great for that area of Bryce Road. That whole thing is going to be redeveloped, but we'll get you into more details about what actually is going there. But finally, I feel like a big weight's been lifted on our show, finally, the Kmart's coming down on the corner of Bryce and Main Street. So that is going to come down uh, towards the end of the summer. But tune in next week at 12 o'clock on Wednesday right here where you will meet the organization that is purchasing it. We're going to talk about why they picked Reynoldsburg. We're going to talk about what's actually going there because it's a large piece of land so that it's not just one thing it's going to be a lot of cool stuff that's going to be working out there we're very excited about it so again kudos to everybody uh, especially director voucher who has not yet had the chance to be appearing on this show because he's just too busy making deals uh too busy trying to bring businesses in and doing some things um it's not always as fast as we want believe me we would have loved to have had this beforehand uh, but we're really excited about this, um, and so it's going to be a great thing all the way around. So please join me again next week on February 10th, where we'll be talking about who's now in charge of that and what's going to happen to it. Uh, we will also have more news on development at my State of the City address on February 25th at 7 p.m. It will be Facebook. Uh, it'll be through kind of like a Zoom thing, so I can show you pretty pictures and a PowerPoint, because why not have a PowerPoint? Uh, but you got to see some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, where we're going, uh, because we're really excited about a lot of things coming here. Uh, but with that, again, uh, Jenny, thank you so much for coming in and taking your time to come out today, uh, talking about it as a former school board member. 
I know it is not an easy thing, but I never had anything to deal with uh, specifically like mm -hmm. global pandemic. Right, um, that right. was one thing that I missed on that one. Uh, so I do appreciate your efforts. I'm looking forward to the kids getting back into school. Um, and you're right. You know, you, I know you're doing all you can to make sure that this year's seniors can have the best, you know, graduation, the right. best senior experience. And I know that hits you personally. So. It does. And my son does not care. Um, <laughs> he absolutely does not. Um, but he'll, he's, he'll be appreciative because his mom will be happy. Right. So do we have any questions? Taking a look on a couple of questions before we sign <laughs> off for the day. Oh, Jenny, they're going to keep coming for you. They've got some right. more questions for you. <laughs> she says, any plans to return to five day per week this school year? It That's really is. It is a very good question. And it really is still, we're looking at um, all those guidelines mm -hmm. that, that the governor has put into place and keeping, again, the students and the staff safe. Um, we try to maintain at this point at six feet distance between students. So in the classrooms, you can imagine that cuts a classroom about in half mm -hmm. when we have to keep six foot distance. So looking at all of that, that would certainly be our hope, but no promises on that. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Mr. Castro, he wants to know if you can summarize how it helps our community to bring in these new developments. Uh, in, in so many ways, one is going to be jobs, um, the amount of jobs that are there. Uh, the way things are working right now is um, the job force is very dependent upon transportation. And the more jobs that you can bring into the city of Reynoldsburg, uh, the more opportunities you can give uh, different members of the community to get a position with that company that they don't have to drive for. Uh, that's better for the environment, obviously, but it's also just better for a lot of people to provide those jobs. So that's part of it. The other part is obviously Bryce Road is a huge thing. Um, Bryce Road is not what it used to be. And this is the first in a long line of steps combined with what we're doing with the new public library that will be in that same area. Uh, that we're gonna try and redesign and redevelop that whole thing. Uh, we are also going to be continuing to advocate for uh, some cooperation between the city of Columbus and the city of Reynoldsburg on how do we deal with issues that confront Bryce Road. Uh, I think our zoning plan does help with that because it makes the process easier for certain businesses to come in. Um, but Steve, I, I, it's, it's going to be a great thing all the way around because it's going to beautify the area. It's going to be one of the entryways into the city. And when you come in off of, you know, off of Main Street from 270, you're going to see an absolutely gorgeous facility that is going to be what puts Reynoldsburg back on the map because we are open for business. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun this next year. All right. Any other questions? All right, so um, again, everybody, uh, for closing remarks, again, um, you know, I want everybody to stay safe and respectful, especially with everything that's going on out there. Um, my wife did not take a picture of me putting about a half a dozen shopping carts away, so please make sure you put your shopping carts away uh, when you go to the grocery store. It's not that hard. I know it's cold. You can do it. I believe in you. Other than that, have a wonderful rest of the day, and again, see you next week for our mystery guest.